this is the, uh, the keynote, the first keynote from myself. I, every year I feel weird. I am a programmer, not a presenter. But the last 20 years, uh, the things has been changed a lot. So this year I'm talking about uh, the, the feeding, a shark, feeding sharks or uh, crushing pipes. Uh, Oasis community is, is kind of like a shark. Yeah, in Jaws. Just because, you know, uh, Oasis community, especially a uh, developer's community, uh, we have to move forward or die. Just because, you know, if you lose interest, we will go away to somewhere else more interesting. Yet, the Ruby was pretty interesting back then, but uh, it's quite boring, so let's move on to another programming language, framework, uh, technology, say, whatever, Node.js, JavaScript. <laughs> but we have to feed the community. So we have to attract the community somehow by showing how to earn money. Rails. <laughs> <laughs> or by enlightening people by philosophy behind the, the language design or the maybe framework design or something like that or by showing the future, the possible future in the, on the technology. So I give a many presentation in past uh, Ruby comps. Like a, I, give, a, I give presentation about the future, basically. So in the, the Ruby Con 2001 that held in Tampa, Florida, it, it was the, the first Ruby comp ever. And it was, I don't know, 30 something people out there. Do you remember? 30, 35? 35, 35 people attended the first Ruby Conf. Yeah, some of them are still attending this conference. So I gave a presentation about the future of Ruby. There was a virtual machine. So uh, back, back in 2001, the Ruby interpreter is pretty naive interpreter of the abstract syntax tree. So, and then the introducing the virtual machine to the language will would, uh, boost the performance of the language. So I give a uh, the future vision of the introducing virtual machine to the language. Then it came became true in 2007 by, uh, by the the Ruby 1.9 due to the work of the, work work of the Koichi Sasada. And then in the next year, RubyCon 2002 in Seattle. So I gave us some uh, vision of the future. The, the M17N and the native thread and the generation garbage collector. So M17N stands for multilingualization. Did I uh, pronounce correctly? <laughs> multilingualization. So, the, the ability to handle the many encodings and of the, from the language everywhere. So uh, back then, Unicode was not that popular. So we have a lot of, lot of encodings uh, nationwide. So you know, the, the people in the United States has ASCII. That's OK. You know, English is so lucky language. And uh, the European people has a Latin one. And uh, in the people in Asian country is kind, has kind of like a nightmare. <laughs> we have so many characters. So back in Japan, we, uh, we have to define 6,000 6, characters, including the Chinese characters and the Japanese characters. So we, the 8-bit the, the, the is too small. So in Japan, back in Japan, we had at least three or maybe four uh, character encoding to represent the Japanese characters. And the Chinese has several ones, that Taiwanese has the others, and the, there are so many uh, character encodings back. And still, still they are. And then, so, 
And then we, so the many programming languages like Java uh, took Unicode to represent every character. But uh, the very early version of Unicode only has 16 bits. So that means that uh, six, 60,000 characters. But uh, you know, the world is wide. So that everyone wants to add their own characters into Unicode. So they are uh, overflowed. So now we have, I don't know, 100,000 characters or maybe more characters in Unicode right now. So the 16 bit was too small. And it, so we like to uh, support uh, many encoding natively without any conversion for, for up to and from Unicode. And then, then I would like to uh, the address the native threads and the generational garbage collector. The, this technology uh, made, became true in these ages. The, Multilingualization in two, 2007, and native set in 2007, and the generational garbage collector in last year. The next year, <coughs> uh, Ruby Cove, uh, Cove 2003, held in Austin, Texas. So we had, this year, I gave a lot of, lot of wild and crazy ideas, and then local variable scopes and the multiple assignments, refinement, keyword arguments, method combinations, selector namespace, and optional static types. And uh, some of them became true. And the local variable scope was, uh, and the uh, local variable scope ideas and the optional static types are uh, abandoned, gave up, I gave up. But uh, the other ideas, multiple assignments, uh, refinement in 1.9, keyword arguments in 2.0, method combination, uh, which is uh, done by a uh, module prepend, uh, is, uh, became true in 2010. Then selector namespace, which now we call refinement, is in the, in the language in 2013. And the next year, in Washington, uh, the Rubicon 2004, held in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, I missed that one. The only RubyConf I missed, uh, regretfully. But the, my young, youngest daughter has, was born this, that year. I couldn't make it. Instead, Brad Cox, the designer of the object with C, gave a keynote at the Ruby conference. And then and Ko, the Koichi gave his first talk on Yarrow. Next year, RubyConf 2005, in San Diego, uh, we, I present the Stabi Lambda and real multi-value and the traits. And uh, I remember almost, every, uh, almost all uh, member, all attendees uh, uh, act against Stabi Lambda. It was too ugly or something like that. But uh, 10 years later, so so many people use Stabi Lambda instead of the L-A-M-B-D-A. So, yeah, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> I was right in language design. So the Stabi Lambda became true in the, the 2007, and then the, the other two ideas uh, I just gave up. <clears throat> Given up. Uh, Rubicon 2006. In Denver, the, in this year, I gave a presentation about the bike shed argument encouraged. But uh, you know, the, we discussed to uh, nourish new ideas about the language design and new frameworks and then. So the, in most of the cases, the bike shed ideas are you know considered the bad, but. Uh, in some cases, like a bike said, argument, ideas are uh, encouraged, like a, kind of like a brainstorming. So I, I didn't get, uh, I didn't present any new ideas that year. In RubyConf 2007, in Charlotte, North Carolina. So in this year, 
the, the Ruby 1.9 was introduced. And then, but that was a huge jump from 1.8. So the, I gave an uh, introduction about the, the language difference and an improvement and a performance gain or something like that. So I didn't give, uh, give a presentation about the, any new ideas. So Rubicon 2008 in Poland, uh, Poland in or Poland, Oregon, right? <laughs> the philosophy is explained. The philosophy behind Ruby language design was explained. So I, I didn't give you no idea. idea. Rubicon 2009 in San Francisco, the power of DSL explained. So no new idea was given. <clears throat> At the same time, the Ruby Kaigi 2009 in Tokyo, I gave a whole lot of new ideas, like a complex literals, the rational literals, true division, and bitmap marking, and the symbols you see. And uh, the most of them, except the true division, was introduced to the language later. The Rubicon 2010 in New Orleans, so I gave up. New ideas like a trace and the module prepend, the refinements, and the right virtual machine, which is beca uh, later became MRB. So these ideas, except mix, which is kind of like a trait, was uh, uh, introduced to the language. Then years in the week of 2001 to 2013, last year, held in New Orleans, Denver, and Miami. And uh, boy, Miami was good. <laughs> so there's new ideas. <laughs> After all, some may become true, some may not. The false rate <laughs> was a 32%. And so, that, so I classified crossfired conferences like this. So the, since the first one to 2005 in San Diego, I. I uh, give a presentation about exciting but uncertain new ideas. Then the year 2006 to 2008, nothing new but philosophy. And the year 2009 to 2013 was uh, improving implementation. So there are new ideas, but uh, they're so nearsighted. So the improving the current implementation of the language. So there's no big deal. So we need to fuel to move on. So it's about time to start talking about Ruby 3.0. <laughs> By the way, uh, we are going to uh, release Ruby 2.2 .2 in coming Christmas. So, and then the, we will add uh, some new improvement to the language, uh, still keeping the compatibility. So the Ruby 2.2 will be a drop-in replacement to Ruby 2.1 for most of the cases. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and so the, the, the session will, the Koichi Sasada will give them. Uh, they talk about the garbage collectors, but uh, he will cover some aspect of the new things in Ruby 2.2. So if you have interest in, in the new things in Ruby 2.2, so go to his session. So the, I'm going to introduce the, the things in Ruby uh, 3.0 to come that would, may happen in the next 10 years. So maybe we will see Ruby 3.0 uh, in 10 years later, or maybe next year. I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> so the huge topic of the Ruby 3.0 will be the concurrency and JIT and static typing. But I'm not going to talk about concurrency, just because I have no specific idea about having concurrency. But I know that everyone complains about the giant global interpreter lock. <laughs> and it, so we, core team, is uh, talking about, uh, uh, discuss about uh, the concurrent, introducing the true concurrency, I mean, the true parallelism 
in, in Ruby, in the C Ruby. So I will try to make something uh, neat in the near future. But uh, uh, I have no concrete idea yet. So JIT, we, we might use LLVM, or we may, might use some other technologies, but uh, the JIT will uh, boost the performance of the Ruby by the factor of two to, to four. So not that you know, great, but uh, you know, the Ruby, Ruby twice faster, Ruby faster two times faster, um, Ruby two times faster is you know, good for you. And a static typing. Static typing? <laughs> Uh, but all new kids in the street, Scala, TypeScript, Dart, Go, uh, they, the new coming language in the 21st century, uh, the, the old new language has the static typing. So the people come to see me to, to talk about the typing, especially optional static typing. So JavaScript can have the type with the, the form of the TypeScript, or maybe the ECMAScript 6. So why not Ruby? Or, may, or some people may, might say the Go has a, some kind of the static typing with the, uh, the form of dark typing. So why not Ruby or something like that? So it's kind of like a crash of type. So the, we had uh, some kind of the, the, the proposal in the, the bug list, uh, feature list, the, the number uh, 9,999. <laughs> But by Davide Di D'Agostino. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's a proposal about the Titan annotations, like, like this. So connect has a the stream and the client, to, then it retreats from Fiverr or something like that. And then Python, yeah, our rival, <laughs> has a uh, PEP, Python M4. Enhancement proposal 30,107, which uh, is a function annotations like this. So it's, it's kind of similar. And uh, interestingly, Python does not check types, even with uh, type annotations. It's kind of like a documentation. Quite interesting ideas. And uh, that, from Google, it works like that. So they can uh, declare types. But it doesn't complain about the wrong type. What is static typing? And then the Python people are also working on the, something named the MyPy, the, which is the optional static type checker. So the benefit, what is the benefit of the static typing? So the, I classified in threefold, the performance and the compile time check and documentation. Performance, but uh, no one complains for faster Ruby. So by adding some kind of the optional static typing, if the Ruby runs faster, so very few people will complain. But uh, do we really need static typing for speed? So JavaScript V8 is uh, quite fast, and uh, Luajit is extremely fast. And uh, both languages, JavaScript and Lua, uh, a dynamic type, no static typing. So if they are so fast so by the technology, like a JIT or a specialization or some other technologies, so why do we need static typing? So we can compress performance with dynamic typing type language. So we don't need static type for speed. So, but the compile time check is very important just because, you know, so how many times you find uh, some silly bugs uh, of the, the type error with type errors? So when you forget tests. <laughs> but uh, like, static analysis is pretty good. So the compile time, uh, compile time checks can find many errors without ex ex uh, the program execution. So the, it's uh, quite nice to refactoring, so you can uh, be sure, so you can be safely uh, refactor things. So the, when you uh, change the name of the method, 
you have to uh, change every uh, occur occurrence of the method call, but uh, you might forget some of them. So and uh, it increased the test coverage. Okay. But uh, the static typing is less flexible. It's, it's against duck typing. So the, the duck typing is a very crucial, very important in the Ruby, uh, Ruby language. So it's quite sad to lose in them. So about documentation, so much better than comment, comments. So we often use comment to know the, the, the value or type that method requires. But uh, we sometimes forget to update the comment when we add the uh, arguments or when we change the, uh, the type of the argument. So the, for consistency's sake, so it's much, uh, the static typing is much better than comments. So no contradiction, no investigation, uh, no investigation into detail. You don't have to read through the method to find out the, uh, the type or requirement of the, to the, for the argument. So that is the PIP uh, 3107 the intention. So Python people uh, use types as, a, as documentation. So, so but uh, there are uh, bad side of the static typing. For, uh, as I said, duck, duck typing op, uh, being option dry, so duck typing. The static typing is against duck typing. So you, the, you declare that this, we need strings here, so you can only call that method with the argument string. But uh, if you want to call it with the string I.O., or maybe the other some compatible types, which behaves like strings, but uh, uh, which is not really a string. So that is duck typing. But uh, if you uh, declare the argument as a string, so the, the something which is not string cannot be called. And then uh, we, we had a guy named Giriku and who uh, who created some kind of the optional static typing back in 2001, which is way old. And uh, he didn't disclose the, his uh, implementation, but uh, he told us from his experience, so optional uh, static typing. He created that to overload methods. But uh, he uh, told us that is not a good idea. Yeah. He didn't speak much in English. He mostly speak, spoke in uh, Ruby. <laughs> but uh, I, I really respect his, uh, uh, his ideas, he, his, uh, his opinion, I mean. Uh, option, being optional. So optional typing is only used for this 99 coverage, I believe. Uh, the language like TypeScript, the, it has the type name, the dynamic, which can hold any type of object. But uh, the most of the cases, the types are defined for methods, libraries, and then something. Then only a fraction of the program can be dynamically typed. In that cases, so we can uh, utilize the static, the, the static typing. But uh, Ruby with 99% option typing is, I don't think it's no longer Ruby. So it's quite difficult to make uh, Ruby 99% optional typing. So Ruby without duck typing, really Ruby? I don't think so. The Ruby should keep being Ruby forever. So 
The JavaScript and TypeScript are very similar, close programming languages, but they are still different. So Ruby, there, there might be a room for the Ruby with uh, some kind of the static typing addition, but uh, I don't think it's, it will be a Ruby as a language. So, and a drive. A drive stands for that don't repeat yourself. So drive principle is, uh, is kind of like a, a avoiding the duplications. So static typing, as I believe, is against drive principle. Just because, so we write code and we write declaration. So for me, writing code, so the vaguely, so what this object, except this operation or something like that. So I have the vague idea of the of types in my mind. So I write down the, the code to represent that. So the code represents the behavior, and the code represents the, the vague uh, requirement to the object. So then I have to uh, extract the the operations, then I formed up the type to, to uh, if I have to declare. So when we already described that require, type requirement in the code, so why should I write down? So the, the fundamental idea of Ruby is do the, the computer the things they can do. So I made some kind, some ideas named the soft typing. The soft typing is the idea was described in the paper in like this or, or that. So which is uh, which is kind of the the adding some, getting some benefit of static typing without adding any declaration in the program. So no declaration needed. So it's kind of best, best effort type checker. So the looking through the program, so extract the, the vague idea I have in mind and write down in the code. So then they add, they guess, Kind of so part of the type inferences, the, which is a ah, soft typing. So, for example, so we have assignment a equal one, which uh, assigns one the integer value one to the the variable a. So the type of uh, a is an uh, integer. So it's it's quite easy and uh, done by the most type inference programming languages. But uh, this is a little bit more complex. So the defined method foo that takes uh, argument x, then the print x, and then call to int. That means the argument of the foo method requires two int method inside. So with that knowledge, so foo, calling foo with one is OK just because one has the two int method. But uh, calling foo with the uh, uh, st string is not good, just because the string does not have a uh, two int method. So this kind of inference, having uh, this kind of inference uh, globally can uh, check types of the most of the, the Ruby program without adding any type of relation, without hindering duck typing. So type is, rep in soft typing, type is represented by the set of methods, which is the name of the method and the number of, and the types of the arguments. And then the, some uh, types can be represented by class or module, but uh, it's, it means a set of methods. 
So the, the, if a variable is uh, typed as a class, say integer, but uh, the object, any object that with, the, that with the signature of integer can be assigned to that variable. So it enables the compact static comp check of types and the detect m more errors. And uh, it, it will be assigned some kind of the best effort type checker. And then the target will be the subset of the Ruby programming language by s or restricting some kind of the dynamic nature of the language. For example, the require with, uh, with variables or expression will be uh, restricted just because you know, the, by adding arbitrary require runtime with that would uh, hinder the, that kind of the global type check or, or define method with uh, variables will be uh, restricted or well, method missing. So the, with this kind of the soft typing, this, say, uh, metaprogramming will be uh, the narrowed. And uh, for documentation with soft typing, so unlike other programming language, so you don't tell compiler types. The compiler will guess your intention and report back to you. So you write down the program, then you, you write, uh, run the program through the compiler. So the compiler will tell you, okay, this variable, I, I guessed uh, you, your intention to this variable is this and this. So is, is this right or wrong or something? Or maybe you generate the information for the documentation or IDE. So without writing any documentation, you, you can uh, understand what is expected as a types. So the, the future compiler will tell you what is your intention. So you, your future compiler somehow reads through your mind, so tell you what your intention. So it's kind of like a two-way communication between the compiler and you. So right now, you write the program, and uh, the compiler will tell you some kind of syntax error, and then the execution systems will uh, raise you some kind of exception about the dynamic nature. So but, uh, in the future, you can communicate with the compiler about your intention. So I, I think your, in, uh, your intention contradicts somehow. So you, you have to fix this or some, fix that. Or maybe, so the ID will tell you, uh, you can call this method and this method, this method for this variable. So, so without, uh, uh, without any information, type information, type declaration from you. So the compiler will much smarter in the future. So the soft typing means that some two languages in one. So statically soft type language and then dynamically type language as current Ruby is. So when soft type typing is not applicable, like, a, like your, your program is so dynamic, so you cannot ap apply soft typing. So the soft typing will not find any bugs, but uh, it means just four bugs to di the dynamic typing, current Ruby. So you will not have benefit of soft typing, but you still have the, uh, the benefit of Ruby itself. So, but uh, if you write down in uh, the, you know, soft, the, the type style of the soft type applicable, uh, so you can get the benefit of the static, uh, uh, st static type checks. So you, it will be strongly encouraged in the former. So the, this kind of the, the soft typing 
will come first in the form of the, the static analyzer. But uh, I think we need some help from uh, the community. Just because you know, I just met through the, the, the paper, the soft typing paper, and uh, the, it is quite different. So the paper was write, written on the language like a scheme, like uh, the procedural, somewhat functional programming language. But the uh, uh, soft typing on top of the object-oriented programming language is so different. So we have to uh, discuss and consider new ideas and, uh, and implement them in the future. So, so we have to work on. That would be take years, but uh, I believe it will benefit the language and it will benefit the community as well. So it's for quicker error detection or for better ID integration. So this is just an idea. So that just like the prior keynotes, this idea might be given up. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know, the, this is uh, the food for thought. We, I, we consider that this is as a food for thought. So we open up the, the gate to discussion for Ruby 2.0. The, these ideas may or may not happen in the future, but uh, that's okay, that's okay. The importance is think seriously about the future, think seriously how can we help ourselves to be better programmer, more efficient, or more, say, money making. <laughs> or that there should be rooms to improve the language. Uh, there should be uh, room to, uh, to improve ourselves as a better programmer, efficient programmer. So let's discuss about the uh, future. It's about the time to start new things. The, that leads us to Ruby 3.0. So I believe future is bright. So the, we, we, will, I, we will promise we will feed you the interesting things, like uh, crazy ideas like soft typing or concurrency or making Ruby faster or anything like that. So let's uh, enjoy programming. So the Ruby makes us happier being happier, so the keep Ruby works for us to make us happier. So prepare for the future, happy hacking, thank you. <laughs>